the instructions a lot of you are used to seeing for a problem like this is simplify. Fairly vague instructions in my opinion. Most people know what it means, but sim simplify. Okay, now, how do you spell simplify? I think I got that right. Yeah, usually this means that the radicand is a perfect square and you just gotta figure out a way to show that this radicand, given an unusual form, is a, is a, is a square integer, okay? I prefer to ask the question this way just as a change of pace, okay? Now, what we do is we make an assumption that it is an integer. Well, actually, we don't quite make that assumption. We just, we can call it in. And if n turns out to be an integer, we have a nice answer, right? But the algebra would be the same, more or less, whether it's an integer or not, I think. But uh, so n is a natural number here. And this first line is fairly simple. If you square both sides and subtract 9, you get this statement right here. Okay, and then what, yeah, what I'm trying to do is show you an approach that does not involve ever knowing the magnitude of this number. Or it's, it's real, be real easy to substitute this in calculator and let the calculator or technology do the work. Most people don't want to multiply this out by hand, and even if they could, they wouldn't know if they were looking at a perfect square or not. So let's let's take a look at this approach that involves prime factorization, okay? Now, it does take a little bit of time to establish that 2 cubed times 3 squared times 5 is 360, and a little less time to determine that 7 times 71, you know, and, and 71 is turns out to be a prime number. And uh, that's important because if it wasn't prime, you'd have to find its prime factors, and you might have more different types of factors to look at, okay? So it makes things kind of simpler that 71 is prime. Now, something I'd like to point out is that this number, whatever it is, and we don't even know how to say it in Hindu Arabic, you know, but it has four uh, times three uh, times two times two times two divisors. Now that's equal to 96. Now, this is not really necessary, but just give you an idea of the, of the task before us. There's 96 divisors to the radicand, including one in the number itself, which we don't know what that number is, okay, or how to say it at least. Okay, so divisors. All right, now, where, do, where does this come from? If, in case you don't know, y'all, I just incremented three. I incremented two to get three, and there's understood exponents of one here, here, and there. And that's a well-known result from number theory. Combinatorics result that tells you how to count the number of divisors. Okay, so there's 96 of them. Now we're looking for a pair of divisors, a pair of those divisors. This this kind of makes it a little bit clear right here that are six apart. So you could rewrite this as x times uh, x minus six, right? Okay. And again, y'all, what I like about this approach is we never have to know really how big this is if you can just pick through the divisors and see if you can find a pair of divisors that are six apart. Now, I've done one example for you right here, but notice that 504 minus 35 is, uh, minus 335 is not uh, equal. Okay, 504 uh, minus 355 does not equal 6. And, you know, I'm, I'm writing it down just for documentation purposes. This does not equal to 6. Some American kids don't know that without a calculator. Now, so... We, what we did is, y'all, we just swapped the roll of the 5 and the 7, and we got a pair of divisors, right? Th these are two of these 96 divisors, okay? But you see, you don't have to worry about the side. The, the, this is an utter, it's a depressing thing to think you have to check all 96. You can just kind of pick and pick and pick until you can spot a pair that it might be 6 apart, right? So this, this rearrangement of swapping the 5 and the 7 didn't lead to a success. But if you spend more time, and I'm trying to mirror the, the it, it took some time, but it turns out the pair that gets it done, uh, I'll write it down for you. It's uh, if you if you move the six over, so that would that would involve writing down two times three. So you see, we're stealing a six from this side, right? We're stealing a six from this side, so we have two squared uh, times three, okay? And it's actually we're we're still up here, right? Uh, 2 squared times 3 uh, times 5 times 7, okay? And y'all, again, we're, we're just trying. Let me put a bigger dot here, okay? Okay, 2 squared, that's not strictly necessary, but hopefully for readability. So this is how I've chosen to re, uh, 
to, to do things. I took this five over here, but I took a two and a three away from this side. And so that would give us a six times seven, D one on this side. So you see y'all, I'm rearranging, I'm rearranging the exponents, rearranging the exponents in a fashion that's gonna turn out favorable because this is equal to 420 uh, times, uh, what's this, 426? 426. But guess what? We have what we're looking for here, right, folks? So that would mean, that would mean, folks, that uh, n plus 3 would have to be this number. And you know, I'm just, I'm kind of excited about this in the sense that you don't, if you can do the prime factorization, which is a task in itself, okay, but you never have to really know the magnitude of the number or whether or not you're dealing with a perfect square or not. If you did determine the magnitude of this number, you'd still have to figure out, is it a perfect square, right? Here, all the computation is happening at the prime factorization level, right? And so what we get right here, this certainly implies that n is equal to um, 423 right? And so all the way back here, we made the assumption that it was equal to some n, right? And so the answer to the question would be yes. And that's because, and I, you know, this is very profound right here, that's because 423 is a member of n. Gosh, and who said we need to reduce all of mathematics to set theory? But 423 is a member of n. So the answer to the question is yes. And again, I know I'm, I'm, I'm tooting my own horn a little too much here, but this is fundamentally different than the approach taken a lot of the time. You know, people don't mess with the prime factorization too much because again, it's a computation in and of itself. And if these numbers are too big in here, then finding the prime factorization is just as hard, really, as determining if the radicand is a perfect square. So I'm not trying to say my way is better, but for this particular problem, I think it is better than trying to do this hand computation and then take the time to figure out is it a perfect square? Now, the, again, the problems on the internet, usually when they mean this, it's, it's tacitly assumed that this is gonna be a square. But it's really kind of a lame problem because it's not as versatile as this problem. This problem is more general, and this wouldn't always be a perfect square. And simplify, simplify presupposes usually that it would have been a perfect square, which is kind of a hidden assumption, you know, there. But in any event, we found it. And again, I had to do quite a bit more discovery on this than what I've shown you. I just wanted to show you one example of where you get a pair of divisors, but their difference is not six. And if you fill around with your time a little bit more, this rearrangement of the divisors gives you a pair of divisors that are six apart, which have to happen because of the power of this difference of two squares factorization. All right, folks, uh, that is all I have to say for you. Thank you for viewing.